For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? It's New Friends Day, and I hope to make lots of new friends tonight. And I hope that my guest tonight, Paul Brogan, who is a friend of mine, will become a friend of all of you tonight. Now, first of all, don't change your dial. I know that a lot of you, or some of you, may expect be expecting Charlotte Crossley tonight. She was uh, scheduled to be here tonight, but... Something came up and she needed to reschedule for tomorrow night. So she will be here tomorrow night and we rescheduled uh, with Paul. And, you know, and I think it's appropriate. I'm going to bring him on right away. Uh, and we've got the stardust in the background uh, because, Paul, uh, the word for today uh, that I chose is belonging. Uh, and if anyone uses the word belonging, uh, they will get a chance to when your book tonight, which we're going to jump into right in a moment. But before we do, I want to ask congratulations, first of all, on your second book coming out. But third. Not, uh, this is your third book. Yeah, third. Okay. <laughs> Beyond this, these books, uh, who or what are you celebrating today? Uh, celebrating the joys of having air conditioning. Um, it's 95 here in Concord. And with the asthma that my doctor promised me I would outgrow by the time I was 20. And now that I'm 23, I still have the asthma. So the air conditioning saves my life and makes it all the better. So that's what I'm celebrating. I have to tell you, uh, to all of our friends in Europe, they are experiencing, and I have friends in Europe, mm -hmm. and I have been corresponding with them. It is amazing what they're going through right now. The railways, the uh, rails are buckling. Uh, tarmacs mm -hmm. are exploding because they are reaching record-breaking heat. Uh, it's mm -hmm. unprecedented. Uh, climate change, we mm -hmm. are going through it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yes. but you're in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, yes. and I have this vision of mm -hmm. Concord being this idyllic uh, Grover's Corners type of a place uh, where everything is idyllic all the time. <laughs> it's, it's somewhat. It was when I was growing up. It's changed and evolved through the years, but um, you probably came through Concord. Didn't you perform over at Newfound Lake about 10 or 12 years ago? Oh my God, I did. I well, more than that. It was actually a, about 15 years ago. I performed at Newfound Lake and yes. I also have performed at the Palace Theater mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Manchester. Manchester. Uh, so, uh, and of course, our mutual friend, Carol Channing, which we'll get to in yes. a few moments as well. Uh, there's so many things to talk about tonight mm -hmm. uh, and we're just going to peel everything back. Uh, as I do with all of our shows, I have a surprise question that I haven't looked at. Okay. And the surprise question is, uh, and it's very interesting because uh, would you rather be rich or famous? Um, rich, because it would enable me to give to some of the charities I give to, but I have to be careful how much and I could give a lot more. So that would be my choice. And I do want to point out all of the proceeds for your book goes to charity. So yes. God bless you for that. So you already are rich. Well, it's been that way with all three books because I consider it a joy just to be able to sit down and write. And uh, that for me is the satisfaction. So, you know, deeming the money toward various charities, either AIDS or senior citizens or animals or something else. 
uh, it's an opportunity to give just a little bit more than I normally would. Well, God bless you for all that you do in all of those realms. And my next question is, uh, get something off your chest in a loving way. So this is your chance right now to get something off your chest <laughs> in a loving way. Oh, wow. And I'm giving you my platform to do so. All right. Uh, what would I get off my chest in a, in a loving way? Um, that I probably, it's always bothered me that uh, Sister Mary Leonard in high school, the guidance counselor, uh, when I told her what I wanted to do, she told me, well, you're not good looking enough to go to Hollywood. Uh, so I think I'd like to let go of that and just say, well, thank you, Sister Leonard. I found other opportunities to do things and I'm, I'm grateful and I understand that you were just trying to keep me humble. Well, I disagree with her, number one. And number two, uh, I'm going to find uh, a little umbrage with a, a few other sisters along your path, which I'm gonna go into in a few moments uh, as well. Uh, as I said, I chose the word belonging tonight. And uh, I wanna say just <clears throat> before uh, we went live tonight, I saw that it passed the house uh, that they, uh, to codify, uh, gay marriage, same-sex marriage, uh, which we all hope will pass in the Senate as well, mm -hmm. uh, because it's important to all of us. But, and it's all about belonging. What yes. does belonging mean to you? And there are so many areas that we can go into. And I chose this word because I think about themes that run throughout your book. And I'm going to go into those in a few moments. Uh, belonging, um, finding a place where I'm just accepted, whether it, uh, you know, is in, was in school or at work or something else and just feeling peace of mind that when I leave at the end of the day, whether it is school or work or something else, um, I'm, I feel a sense of contentment and satisfaction at having accomplished something. And I think I need an environment that makes you feel like you belong in order to thrive at whatever I happen to be doing. Now, your book, uh, I mean, first of all, your first, uh, this book, uh, and this is, was that a name I dropped? I loved this book so much. And your latest book, which we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, A Sprinkling of Stardust Over the Outhouse. How did you come up with this title? I always come up with the title first. And then Alan, my husband, does a dummy of the cover, which I hang over the computer to inspire me to be structured about my writing. And I was trying to think of, I didn't want to say, is it okay to say shit happens on your show? <laughs> but I mean, we all have instances in our life where things and somebody says to you, oh, well, well, shit happens. Well, in this uh, case, that belongs in the outhouse. And just to make sure it stays there, sprinkle a little stardust over the outhouse just to make sure it's securely locked away and it's not going to come back to um, get you at some point. Wow, wow. It, and it's so interesting that so many people now are using uh, that, that title uh, mm -hmm. in, you know, in mm -hmm. podcasts and everything. So uh, good for you for going in another direction with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that was at the beginning of your book, uh, we'll go back to the very, very beginning. Uh, and then uh, I asked for a photograph of you around five years old. You were born on Halloween, yes. which I love the fact that you were born on Halloween. Mm -hmm. uh, but in uh, school, the sisters did not want you to acknowledge the fact that you were born on Halloween. Uh, so they moved the date uh, and asked that you not even acknowledge the fact, which is very much a part of your identity. Uh, and it, it seems to me as, as if you're getting off on the wrong foot uh, at the very beginning of your life. So. 
I want you to talk a little bit about that. You go into details in the book and we want people to buy the book. So we're not going to give away too much, Mm -hmm. Uh, but how that affected you. And then we'll go back a little further (laughs) in thing in terms of things that you found out about your actual birth parents and, uh, and your, the parents that you grew up with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, uh, Halloween was considered the devil's day and it was not appropriate uh, for a nice Catholic. Um, And in fact, when they first started doing it, I had just barely been baptized, not baptized, uh, first communion. And so Sister Mary John was the one who took great offense with the date and just announced we're going to have you born on October 30th, the same day. There were twins, uh, Betty and Bonnie, in my class, and they decided that that works much better. uh, And from now on, you've been born on October the 30th. And it was just that simple. It was and there was no room for discussion. Um, I felt sort of ashamed of it because up to that time, uh, I was in public school the two years before and my mother would give me a Halloween birthday party and my friends would come dressed up. And now suddenly uh, that wasn't acceptable. Uh, So it was a very strange, but I learned not to question it because you didn't question either the sisters or the priests in those days. You know, it was everything was uh, taken on faith or you know, something like that. So you didn't uh, say, well, that's not my date of birth or I, I'll show you my birth certificate or something else. So that was, uh, it was just what was done. And uh, for years and years, I acknowledged October 30th until I was in high school and a very nice nun took me aside and said, you know, it's okay to be born on October 31st. We're all different and we're all born on different days. Well, it seems to me as if from the very, from the outset, uh, that that kind of thinking um, denies the very essence of who you are. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think, I think it, it certainly can to an impressionable child who's already uh, questioning uh, because of the asthma I had, and I, you know, in those days before there were inhalers, you were simply told, now Paul cannot exert himself. He's not to go outside and play. He's not to do this and that uh, because it'll bring on an asthma attack. And so uh, you are already wondering, well, your friends are wondering, well, why doesn't Paul come out and play baseball or do this or do that? And you don't really, well, you have an explanation, but children at six, seven, eight don't have the depth and ability to have the sensitivity of, oh, I get it, except for one friend that I had who really understood all of that. And, and he, uh, I was his movie friend when he wanted to go to the movies and when he wanted to play at the park, he had another set of friends so that it, it balanced out and he was wise beyond his years. No, I asked for a photograph around five years old. I think you're around six years old. I love yes. this. You haven't changed at all. Uh, and uh, about six years old. What are your memories of this little boy? Um, uh, he was incredibly happy when he was sitting in front of the television watching a movie or sitting at the piano. I started lessons when I was about five. So by the time I was six... I had progressed beyond one fingers and I was using both hands, keeping my knuckles, of course, very curved because Mm -hmm. that was drilled into you. If you want to be a good pianist, you have to do that. And so that was just when I was sitting at the piano or when I was watching an old movie on Channel 8 out of Mount Washington television, um, I was just nothing could touch me. Nothing could affect me. I was just a happy-go-lucky little child. And you learned early on that you were adopted. Yes. Uh, and uh, and we, I have another photograph here, and I love this photograph. Uh, here you are, and we can point you out here. You're in the center here. Uh, of course. And, and, and uh, I don't know, uh, you are there right in the center of this photograph. Um, what are your memories of this? And 
were you already aspiring to wanting to go into show business <laughs> at an early um, age? I sort of wanted to be an opera singer, actually, is what I wanted to be, but which is, of course, part of show business. But uh, this was a play. My mom directed it uh, for the Girl Scouts, and the, uh, they were uh, earning money to make a trip to Washington, D.C. And so all the Girl Scouts were in it, and the children of the troop leaders, the boys, were elves, which is what I was. So there were about four or five of uh, the boys that were elves. But of course, at, when I told Sister Mary John what I had done, and she thought I had joined the Girl Scouts, and she brought that to the attention of the class. But I just remember the first time I walked out on the stage, there were about 900 people filling the auditorium. It was the city auditorium. I remember the heat from the uh, footlights and how wonderful it felt. You couldn't see beyond the orchestra pit. Uh, everything else was just lost. But that warmth uh, instantly seemed to just wrap itself around me like a blanket or something. And it just felt like the right place to be. And there were no nerves or anything at all about that. But you felt that you were growing up in a very idyllic world. I mean, you describe. I mean, the way that you describe your home life, your mom mm -hmm. uh, was very much uh, Donna Reed. Uh, you know, uh, the the mother that we saw on Leave It to Beaver yes. and everything. And if you can <clears throat> take us back to what your home life was like, and and then you can tell tell us a little bit about finding out about your being adopted. Okay. Uh, yeah, mom uh, had gone to Juilliard. And so she uh, spent the days doing the things around the house and getting supper ready. But at quarter three, uh, students arrive for piano lessons Monday through Friday from 2.45 until 5.45. She had six students each day, about 30 a week. Uh, and various ages, so various range of, of ability to play. But everything was all taken care of before that. I mean, when I would come home from school, the house was clean. Supper was ready to be served at six o'clock. Um, she was beautifully attired, uh, usually one of those sweaters with one of those clips across that mm -hmm. hold it on the shoulders. And uh, just the house was filled with music. And it just seemed uh, just perfect, exactly what I was seeing on Father Knows Best or any of the shows. Uh, although I once did say to her, I wish you could be more like Gracie Allen on Burns and Al. <laughs> I, but... Uh, but she was uh, she loved doing that. That was her grocery money and her mad money that she kept inside. Um, women at that time would keep a certain amount of money uh, 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 pinned to their brassiere in case you were someplace. If you were in the A and P and you didn't have enough money in your purse, you'd call on the you know resources. But uh, it was uh, it was very nice because of the music and their involvement with the community theater crew. So you had uh, a lot of creative energy going on in the house. My father always did the uh, reprimanding. It was always, wait till your father gets home. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sure that that impacted uh, some of, you know, the, the um, attitude that I sometimes had toward him. But when they told me about being adopted, they opened this book, the Catholic Charity, and I'd been adopted through Catholic Charities, had given them. And they opened it up, and it was about these two people who couldn't have a child. God didn't bless them, or the guardian angel didn't come down to bestow that upon them. So they went to a grocery store, and they went to what looked like the vegetable department where you would see watermelons and things except they were all babies on <laughs> these shelves and and they would pick in the in the picture book they would pick them up and look them over and pass them back and forth before making a decision on what they wanted and so 
the story concluded. So when we picked you up and checked you out and decided, we felt that you were the one that we wanted. And in the thing, they go to the checkout counter and there's a priest at the checkout counter blessing this child going into this home. And it's, <laughs> And my mother still sense. has the book at the house. It's up in the attic at her house. Wow. And, God bless her. Um, I, I think at some point the Catholic Church probably stopped using that because some of the visuals and the imagery probably, you know, traumatized. I had uh, night um, uh, nightmares when I was growing up uh, where, what is it, night uh Night you terrors. can't wake up. Night terrors, yes. And I wonder sometimes if that book way in the recesses of my mind may have contributed to, you know, some of some of that. But no. yes. No, go ahead. Keep going. So that was when I, I found out. And I was just uh so I said, I remember asking very clearly, was I born in the store? where they had gone, because I knew that, you know, mm -hmm. children were born. Um, but, and they said, no, no, uh, some people had you, but couldn't keep you. So they gave you to the Catholic church. So, um, which was sort of the line they used years later when they wanted me to have a vocation and become a priest. We would like to now return you to the Catholic church. So as time is going on and you're living in Concord, New yes. Hampshire, and you are starting to formulate who you are uh, beyond, uh, you know, that uh, circle of where you are, you begin to decide what you want to do with your life. And mm -hmm. if you can, you know, as you start to form that, can you tell us a little bit about the young man that you are beginning to become? Okay. Um. I wanted very much to either sing grand opera, um, which of course you have to have a voice for, or do something in some kind of show business. I didn't know if necessarily on the stage, although uh, I enjoyed doing that, but I sort of was drawn to doing something behind the scenes, maybe writing scripts or uh, doing something more in that angle, uh, writing or directing or producing or something like that, uh, all of which I got to do in various ways mm -hmm. later in life. Uh, but that was sort of, uh, although I really, I learned arias from operas. I learned German arias. I didn't know what the words meant, like Meine Lieben Se Kusen So High by Franz Lehar was one of my favorites. And I would go around the house singing it, not noticing that my father was going like this um, when I would hit a high note. But um, it, But it seemed like, the kind of life, because the movies brought me such joy when I watched old films and even new films. And so I knew that that was an area that I could probably do something with, whereas I wasn't going to be a baseball player. The asthma limited so many of the things that I could envision doing. And I didn't have any interest in being a doctor or a lawyer or anything like that. Although if I'd become a lawyer, I probably could have saved myself a lot of money later on. But uh, so it, it always, there was that, that glamour of show business. And whenever I had the chance to be in a show, I did it, but uh, it never gave me the same level of satisfaction as thinking in my head when I would read a book, how it might look as a film, you know, plotting and planning it out and, and all of that seemed to me uh, something more satisfying because I felt that I realized rather early that I wasn't, I wrote letters to Disney and other people and suggested they screen play me, uh, screen test me when I was about 10 or 11. And uh, Disney's the only one that wrote back a form letter from mm -hmm. the studio saying that they urged me to get an education and, you know, all of that. But um, so everyone was spared a series of Paul Brogan as a precocious child films. But 
uh, it did make me recognize, well, being an actor was looked at as fine in community theater, but it wasn't something someone did for a living. Uh, you need to find a job, Paul, that pays well, that you can work at for 40 years, retire with a gold watch and a pension, and just be stable. Don't be thinking these highfalutin notions because it's not going to work out. And I know my parents were being realistic, just as the nuns were, mm -hmm. but... Um, it, it uh, because people don't didn't want you to be disappointed or fail, but you learn from failure or disappointment. But uh, people from Concord, New Hampshire, for the most part, didn't go on to achieve that kind of notoriety or fame or success. Now, you are a brilliant writer, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. Um, <clears throat> I love your writings, your blogs, your articles that I've read over the years. Um, was the writing always something that you aspired to? Or when you sat down to write your first book, which mm -hmm. I want to get to uh, as well, uh, was that always, did you always think that you were going to have these books in your future? Yes. I started out by writing screenplays and, and adapting books that I loved, like a separate piece that we read in school, uh, Jim Kir James Kirkwood's Good Times, Bad Times, mm -hmm. uh, that I loved. And I did a screenplay and sent the script to Shelley Winters because I wanted her to play Patty, the Chanteuse at the Sayport Hotel. And um and I met her years later at the Silver Spoon in West Hollywood, and we had lunch together and talked about what I had done and how she'd never received it. But um, I love the notion of taking these and sitting in my room away from everything else and just pecking away at the typewriter for hours and hours and creating these. Sometimes I created my own stories, but often it was from a book and it felt right. Expressing myself in that way gave me, I said to somebody once, this kind of satisfaction if you hit a home run and, and won the game for your high school or something like that. For me, doing that was a completely satisfying uh, sense of accomplishment. Now, I was thinking the other day, uh, and I'm trying to figure out, and maybe you can clarify something for me. Mm -hmm. How did you and I meet? Was it through Doris Day, the, that connection, or was it Carol Channing? I think Carol. Carol Channing, yes. Because... Um, I brought Carol and produced two fundraising events for her in New Hampshire. And she was always talking about you. The first one was in 2007 uh, that I sent you the picture of us where right. I gave up wearing shorts. And I, I uh, <laughs> so, um, she talked mm -hmm. endlessly. Yes at the Capitol Center for the Arts in Concord. Um, and that's in June of 2007. And she's sharing this wonderful story um, before we went up on the stage to start the rehearsals. And um, so 15 years ago, she talked over dinner because Alan and I spent a lot of time with her and Harry, her last husband, yes. who adored you also. And uh, she kept talking about Richard's, why Richard, Richard, so wonderful. And how she just adored you. And she said at one point to me and Alan that if I could have another son, it would be Richard Skip. Oh, my and, God. That's wonderful. And I just remember I got a lump in my throat when she said that because I oh. hadn't met you yet. But she was just so wonderful. Her face just lit up. I mean, she just really, as you know, her face mm -hmm. when she believes in something. And so... That's when I felt I've got to get in touch with Richard Skipper. And so I tracked you down and then made the contact and you were just as wonderful. Um, I had wanted to go see you at Newfound Lake 
and I was working for an AIDS organization and we had the night that we did free testing and gave out free condoms and everything. So I couldn't go, but the people from the office that went said, Oh my God, he's amazing. If you ever get a chance mm-hmm. to see him again, you have to. So, um, but so that's how about 15 years ago, um, Carol brought us together. Well, and- uh, I, I do want to mention that when she came there, uh, she went around to, see all the AIDS patients. Yes, she did. The clients that we gave free tickets to the clients in both instances, she came to Concord and then to Portsmouth and we gave free tickets for our clients to come, but some were too ill or they had Kaposi sarcoma and didn't want to leave the house because of how they looked and they were afraid of being misjudged. So um, I said to her, she asked me, she said, are, are your clients coming? I said, many of them are, but some can. And she wanted to know why. And I explained, she said, well, we've got to go bring a little bit of cheer to them. And so we went to the house of about half a dozen different clients, um, knocked on the door and they would answer. And she said, I'm Carol, as though they didn't know. <laughs> and and she would say, you know, I understand you're not coming to my show and you're not able to. But she said, I'd still like to come in and talk to you for a minute. So she would go in and sit down next to them on the couch or the chair or whatever, take their hand in hers. And she would sing a little bit of a song, whether Little Girl from Little Rock or a little bit of Diamonds or a Girl's Best Friend. A couple of instances, she asked their first name and sang a little of Hello Dolly using their name. And the tears just pouring. And Harry was even crying watching it. But it made, in a couple of instances, our clients passed away within a couple of months. So this is probably one of the last memories of something wonderful that they had. But that, as you know, is the kind of person she was. Yes, absolutely. Well, your first book, uh, and I love the title, I love both of your titles, but uh, was that a name I dropped? Um, when you sit down to write a memoir, and we're going to talk, because you talk uh, in the beginning of this uh, latest book also, um, when you sit down to write a memoir, mm-hmm. uh, as you did with the first book, yes. what compelled you, first of all, to want to sit down to tell your story? Well, I did. I, I knew that as I was growing up, there were no books by memoirs by gay authors that I could go to the Concord Public Library and take out as a way of maybe showing me what life or something might be about uh, or what I might expect at some point. Uh, in fact, you couldn't even take out Valley of the Dolls without your parents' permission. It was that you know, very staid times. So um, I said, I think some of the things that have happened to me have been uh, wonderful, some not so wonderful, but maybe somebody will read about that. And if they're having issues with depression, for instance, or if they're feeling suicidal, maybe they'll realize I need to go and get help, help, or something, so I don't end up on a back road with a hose and the exhaust of the car like Paul did or something like that. So that uh, maybe it could make a difference because I said to Alan, I said, you know, we're never going to have children, uh, but it would be nice to leave a legacy or a story or something behind that I was here, I had an interesting life with lots of detours and mistakes and other things, but I was true to myself and I never stopped getting up when I got knocked down and I didn't just throw in the towel and say, Oh, that's it. Um, You know, there's, there's no point in going on. So that was, that was really the reason. That was the impetus. And did you have an editor when you sat down to write your first book? Or... No, I didn't, and it shows. Um... No, no. Well, you, you, you were honest about that. You do mention, uh, yeah. you, you know, as writing this book, that this is not. You don't consider this a sequel. Mm-hmm. You, uh, but you wanted to, uh, but you were 
proud of the fact that mm -hmm. even after the book came out, that mistakes and all, warts and all, yes. it's out there. Yes. And yes. you don't regret that. No, not at all. Because regrets are you know, a waste of time. I mean, I don't want to be sitting at a nursing home at 90 saying, why didn't I do that? You know, an expression I use in the book is life is a buffet table and it's filled with offerings. And if you only go to the offering that you've had before and that you know you're going to like, you may miss out on so many other things by not trying something else or something different. And I realized that I wasn't going to be that person who had the same job for 40 years and retired with the gold watch. I was going to be, which some people misdiagnosed as bipolar or manic depression. Well, why did he switch jobs again? Why did he go over and start doing AIDS work when he was doing this kind of work? But it isn't. It's a case of you're only going this way once unless you're Shirley MacLaine and you're going to be reincarnated. But um, you'd better um, jump at opportunities when they're there so that you know, you know, you may be able to influence somebody else by having, you know, moved in a different direction. Well, when you wrote the first book, I'm sure that there were things that you learned about yourself uh, that you probably had not even thought about. Uh, have you kept, do you keep journals uh, uh, no. over the years? No, so it was I didn't. Just recall. Yes. The nuns always said I had an amazing ability to store things away, which can be very good, but it can be, uh, if you don't let go of some things, it can also be very troubling or something. Um, the instance that happened when I was in college, for instance, but but that was the era when uh, if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. So you think that it's just going to dissipate and go away, but it doesn't. It stays down in there and then it comes back and it creates a wealth of problems for you uh, later on in life. What I mean, again, there's there's a gap between the two books. Um, and forgive me, it's how many years now? 12, 12. 12 years. Uh, why now? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm moving along. I'm on Medicare and Social Security. And um, I still have a really sharp mind. And during the pandemic, I had been planning to do a book, a murder mystery. It would have required me to be able to go out and do a lot of research to go with that, which I couldn't do. So it was a case of being in the house, uh, safe and all of that. So it seemed like the right time to both uh, fix some of the things that I didn't get a chance to fix in the first book and to share some of the other stories because my perspective toward life and just everything in general is much different than it was a decade or so ago because of the experience that I've had in the last 10 or 11 years with the teaching. Uh, my parents wanted me to be a teacher at one point, and that's why I went to Plymouth State where the incident occurred. And uh, I ended up suddenly in my late 50s and 60s teaching. Uh, because I'm doing it because I want to, not because I'm being steered in that direction. And I've had a chance to do a radio show and then a television show and to just do things that I never thought I would be doing at this juncture in life. So the book at that time uh, felt right because if I tried to complete the mystery, it wouldn't have been right because it I couldn't have verified some of the things that I needed to make it work. So uh, it was 1,234 hours it took me. Mm. And uh, because I did it like a job, I did it from nine in the morning until 1130 and then from one until four, five days a week. And it had to be very structured because otherwise, if you're just doing it as a hobby, oh, I think I feel like writing today or no, I'm going to skip a few days it doesn't get done and you procrastinate, you know, in a way. So it has to be a job. And where does Alan come into the equation? 
did Alan, uh, did you share everything with Alan as you were writing things? No. And, oh, you didn't? <laughs> no. Um, well, he he went to Rhode Island School of Design and is a phenomenal creative director for a luxury linen company. And we've been together 17 years. And um, I love hearing about what he's doing. And he likes hearing about what I'm doing. But I don't want to give it away because if he were to look even slightly askance at something I was sharing or saying, now this is what this is and I'm doing this and I'm writing about this, I would be the kind of person that would say, uh-oh, that's not going to work. That look says it all. So I need to not have, until it's ready to go to an editor, uh, not to have that kind of input that might take me off course. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. And I think that's the secret. Uh, Danny and I have been together uh, going on 32 years. Wow. And uh, he's a landscape architect. He does what he does. Mm -hmm. And, and it, the great thing about him being in the audience is when I hear him laugh or I, I hear the response, I go, okay, if he's still laughing after all these years, mm -hmm. it's great. Mm -hmm. Um, but he doesn't give real input into the creative process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, unless he feels that, but he doesn't really feel that he, it, it's not his expertise to give yes. direction on yes. that. Mm -hmm. um, but after the book is completed, did he come in and have any feedback or anything after he had seen the whole story? No, he wanted to wait until it was actually published. And he's going to sit down and read it um, soon. Um, and I, I did read a couple of chapters after it was all done uh, to him that I was especially the Catherine Hepburn story in New York. I read him that because that was what I said. Is this the story I should read at the book event here at Gibson's bookstore in Concord? And I read it and he said, absolutely, it'll be perfect. You will have them salivating over getting the book as a result of that. You have, I feel, when I look back over mm -hmm. my own life, mm -hmm. when I think of the players that have been a part of my life, uh, and I'm sure it's the same thing with you. Mm hmm what surprises you the most? Because, I mean, I, I, I'm just going to show them the, the cover of your previous book. And mm -hmm. here you are together with Doris Day. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you because you worked tirelessly to set up an interview with Doris and me. And I'm sorry uh, it didn't work. So it, we, it came close, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't happen. And But you uh, were trying to make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was a friend. The fact that I can say that Carol was a dear friend. Mm. Looking back over everything, <clears throat> what surprises you the most? Because you manifested all this. Um, I, uh, well, I never, it's not arrogance when I say I never didn't believe I could. I mean, when I, first got Carol to come to New Hampshire. It was picking up the phone and calling. Harry answered and et cetera. With Eileen Fulton, when I brought her to do her wonderful Dinner with a Diva dinner theater show, um, I called up and I said, I've loved you as Lisa for all these years. Would you come to New Hampshire? Um, so it just, uh, I guess maybe a little surprise that they always said yes, whether it was Greg Louganis or... Jack Jones or anybody else, uh, that they always said yes without hesitation. There was no, well, let me have my agent get back to you, or I need to have my business manager get in touch. Uh, it was always, because I think I I didn't gush uh, really. I mean, I like t telling Eileen, I've loved you on As the World Turns, but I, I didn't go on and on and on. The only time that I ever did that uh, was the first time I met Doris in 1973. Uh, her secretary, Marianne, uh, arranged when I got to town on, on my trip and set everything up and uh, went to the house and everything else. And um, 
I suddenly felt, I looked at Doris and said, you know, I saw with Six You Get Egg Roll 54 times. And I loved um, the response. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, and you didn't get diabetes? Yes. Um, and, and that's when I realized, you know, I don't want to be, you know, this, this gushing person. Uh, and she wanted to talk about animals and she wanted to talk about actors and others for animals and uh, things like that, which mattered to her. And, uh, and, and I realized, you know, over the years that most of these people don't want, they get that all kinds of places, but uh, I don't need to do that uh, if there's another reason for my being in contact with them or, you know, having an interaction with them. So well, um, we're going to give away a copy of your book. And I think you said you would sign it personally. I would with yes. pleasure. And so, I will send it so along. What we're going to do, the uh, what you need to comment with the hashtag belonging uh, to win the book tonight. And I've got some questions, some wind down questions for you. Um, so you've met, and again, there are all these great stories uh, in both books. Uh, order the other book as well, everyone. Um, fun, it, it's and it's difficult uh, to get the other book. Uh, mm -hmm. You found out it was being sold on eBay uh, a couple of years ago. How much was it being sold for? Six or seven hundred dollars. Wow. After Doris passed away in 2019, I think anything that had her on a cover or something, and I think that that was the reason that suddenly somebody decided, oh, I can get all kinds of money for this. And she would have been appalled by it. And I remember thinking, well, if they gave $599 of it to an animal charity, you know, and only kept a dollar, that would be good. But um uh, yes, it, it, it's very difficult now to find that one. Uh, so a fun fact about a favorite actor that you met. Um, let me see. A fun fact. Uh, well, uh, oh, dear. Um, Joan Crawford hated Pepsi. Uh, loved Coca-Cola. <laughs> Now you've ruined it for everybody. I'm sorry. But no, she, she, uh, that was a long, 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 long time ago. But uh, I was fortunate enough to get an autograph for the lady that owned the movie theater in Concord that I worked at for 27 years. And uh, she was drinking uh, Coke. She did not like Pepsi. Uh, did they switch the bottles for her? Um, I, I'm sure. For the money, she was probably being paid as a spokesperson. She she drank it, but I think that uh, probably privately, the other has a little more kick to it. So, Paul, I want to commend you for all the uh, philanthropic work that you do. But <clears throat> what do you think your purpose in life is? Um, when I started doing the AIDS, because in the 1980s, people were passing away left and right. All of my friends, my address book was, you know, um, and I engaged in some behavior that was certainly risky for certain. Um, and yet I remained HIV negative and am to this, to this day. So at one point I realized maybe I meant to start doing work in that field of HIV AIDS, working for AIDS service organizations, which don't pay a huge amount of money because they're grant monies that are, you know, for targeted grants. But the satisfaction that you get in making that difference is tremendous. So for me, doing that and then being able to change minds in some of the straight community. A lot of straight people would have given money to a warm and fuzzy charity uh, or something, but wouldn't give money to AIDS. Oh, those people have AIDS. So by bringing people like Patty Page, I brought who lived in New Hampshire, she had a maple syrup farm and I brought her for four concerts and then Jim Bailey and Carol and Jack Jones and others, you attract uh, a mixed 
audience of straight people and gay or gay friendly. And suddenly you're getting a message out to these straight people that, oh my God, if Patty Page is asking us to remember those with HIV AIDS in our own state, maybe there's more to this than I'm realizing. So uh, that was the most satisfying and joyous part was being able to change minds and perceptions and uh, do it uh, in, in a way that I think everyone came out a winner. Well, God bless you for that. Um, what is the best thing that you feel that you've done uh, in your profession beyond what you've just told us? Um, <clears throat> let me see. Getting paid a wonderful amount of money to do something I love, playing the piano. When I played in a Gunquit, Maine, uh, and uh, just the joy of sitting there and playing from six o'clock in the evening until one o'clock when the place would close. What did you play? And, um, I, I played uh, for a while at Valerie's, which was uh, a wonderful place. I played at a place called the Beechcrest Inn and the Black Swan. And, uh, and I wouldn't take bathroom breaks or anything because that's the moment somebody walks, uh, walks into the place. Oh, there's nobody sitting at the piano. I guess we'll go elsewhere or something mm. instead of coming over and taking a seat around the piano. Uh, and I played at Napoleon's in Boston a few times, many, many years ago, which was a treat. That was just a, a, a jewel because it's the first gay bar I had ever gone in in 1975. So to have the chance to come back later on and play a few times was just wonderful because I saw sitting around the piano me as a 21 year old having the first experience in a gay bar looking around. And uh, it just made it all the more special what I would play. That's wonderful. Uh, I love those circles. Um, when do you think that you were the most shocked in your profession about anything that you've experienced in your profession? When, La when actor Leon Ames made it very clear to me in 1973 that he wanted to go to a hotel room with me, um, and, and, uh, um, he called it, we could do some groin grinding. Oh my God. And Leon Ames is somebody I had grew up seeing in hundreds of movies. And I think I, I said to you that it spoiled going to Peggy Sue got married when he showed up as Peggy Sue's grandfather, because I could hear him saying this to me at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in June of 1973. And I, I, it was my first trip to California and I don't think I was prepared for this man who was there with his lovely wife, Chrissy, uh, to be taking me aside and informing me of something like that. And of course, I didn't know how to go ask somebody, do you know what he just said? Uh, because I knew it wasn't a joke, but uh, I wasn't experienced enough as a, as a gay person, even though I'd been out since I was 10, uh, to really know how to uh, assess that. And it, it troubled me. That night, I hardly slept. I was really bothered. But it just totally shocked me. Well, well, that leads me to my next question. Uh, what is the best way for you to relieve tension that is not sexual? <laughs> um, to sit down at the piano. Absolutely. If I play a Chopin or something very dramatic, a Polonaise or a Grieg piece, like the Hall of the Mountain King or something, um, that gets rid of any stress or pressure that has built up. Um, otherwise, I will sit and play... Uh, you know, Gershwin or Cole Porter or Irving Berlin or something like that, just for the sheer enjoyment. But when I get there and I'm doing uh, a Tchaikovsky or something like that, uh, you know that something has happened that has caused me tension or stress or something like that. Now, I probably know the answer to this next question, but when have you been the most silent? 
the most silent. Oh dear. Um, uh, probably the first, uh, in many ways, the first 18 years of my life, as far mm -hmm. as you didn't speak out about something, you didn't complain, you just bucked up, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, don't complain. Um, remember uh, Christ on the cross, he had problems, you don't have anything. Uh, and I would keep anything that was not right or bothering me inside and just kept it there. So in that way, being very, very silent. Wow. Um, who is the most interesting person that you have met in this business that surprised you beyond your expectations? Okay. Uh, Sidney Gilleroff. <clears throat> um, a lot of people don't know who he is, uh, although if you Google, you'll see well, thousands sure. of films, of who course. He is. But I didn't know what to expect. Um, I invited him to the Jeanette McDonald Fan Club Banquet because he had worked with her in many films. And I wasn't sure uh, what, what Sidney Gilleroff was like because that time in 1980, you couldn't go online and see pictures or things. And he didn't give interviews or talk about his personal life and all the people he'd worked with. So uh, I didn't know what to expect. And when he walked up to me and gave me a big hug and say, dear boy, it is such a pleasure. I am honored to meet the man who writes me such interesting letters. Mm. Um, it totally surprised me that he was saying that before I could say, you know, your work, for instance, in Marie Antoinette should be in the Guinness Book of Records as beyond brilliant or something. But uh, he totally surprised me. Wow, that's great. What a great story. Um, what are you currently working on or what's next after this book? Um, the Park is the next next book. Um, and that's a murder mystery set in White's Park here in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, in 1962, a body is found floating in the pond. And I'm having a great time with that. And then I have three classes I'm teaching, film classes, including one at Dartmouth uh, later this year. That's on Katherine Hepburn. So I can do my imitation of Katherine Hepburn from Coco. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, and, and so I'm doing that. And then I'm still doing my television show, which is mostly I spotlight local nonprofits or local individuals who sort of go under the radar. And it's an opportunity to bring them to the attention of, of, of some people. So those are the big things. And uh, Alan and I are hoping to go to New Hope for the first time since 2009, uh, this October, for my birthday, on October well, 30th and 31st. Well, call me. Maybe we'll we meet will. there. I'd love we that. Will. Um, do you meditate? Yes, I do. Totally. Great. No music, no distractions at all. What is the best prize that you've ever won for your work? Um, well, beyond compliments, winning uh, an award from the New Hampshire Press Association was the first time I ever won anything for writing. Um, and that was, that's when I realized, oh my God, maybe I am a writer. And that was just totally satisfying. But on the other hand, the compliments that I, like the email I shared with you today that I had yeah. received from somebody. That's uh, more than icing on top of the cake. And my last question, what is the best ritual of your daily life? The best ritual uh, is to um, shave. Seriously. Uh, because finally... At my age, I've gotten good at it without getting nicks. Forever, it's all been uh, drawing blood. But uh, I finally found this way, and it brings me great satisfaction that I look, oh, my God, I did it again. 
So yes. Good for you. It's like, I, I, I think of Judy Garland in A Star is Born when she talks about washing her hair. Uh -huh. you know, so I get it. Uh, so we're going to give away your book. Uh, yes. And we've got a few people here. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, it is an incredible book. Uh, congratulations, Paul. I just love the book. And Frank Saletti. I love you, uh, Frank. And I'm going to put you both in touch with each other. Okay. Uh, you're both on Facebook, so connect. Uh, right. Frank right. is an incredible guy, Paul. Hi, Frank. Uh, you, uh, you know, should really connect with each other. Uh, All right. So I'll put you in touch with each other. I'm going to remove uh, you, Frank, here from here. So I'll uh, connect you. Um, Paul, I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank uh, you. You are welcome. Uh, you are such an inspiration to me uh, with everything that you do. Uh, I love your books and thank you uh, for all you do uh, and you belong. And I'm so glad uh, belonging. Uh, and I want to talk to all of you uh, tonight. I've been thinking about belonging with, uh, you know, the uh, House today uh, voting on uh, same sex marriage. Uh, it's a slippery slope. Uh, that we're all uh, experiencing right now. Uh, if you blink, if you close your eyes, uh, you know, a dear friend of mine who may see this later uh, said she was, you know, just not even thinking about the news today. We all need to get away from the news from time to time, but don't close out completely as to what's going on. I have friends who are not even aware of what's going on these days. And I'm not getting political, uh, but I just want you all to be aware of what is happening uh, because it's important not for us, but for the next generation and those after that. Uh, we need to pave the way for our future uh, and our, uh, uh, our kids and uh, the next generation. Uh, so I wanna thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, you could all, all have been anywhere else tonight, but you chose to be here with Paul and myself. And I'm sure that I can speak for Paul when I say this, we don't take it lightly. So if you had a great time tonight, I hope that after tonight's show that you will go to YouTube and you will leave a comment about what you thought of tonight's show, that you will leave a comment, that you will share this with your friends and that you will pay this forward. And then after the show, I would like you to go to your Facebook friends list and I would like you to reach out to the fifth name that pops up and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, because as my dear friend, friend Sean Moniger always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. But I always say, if you're gonna go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So Paul, I'm gonna leave the screen and I'm gonna give you the final word. Uh, it can be about anything that we talked about tonight that you wanna build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you wanna leave everyone with tonight. I thank you once again. This is the book, everyone. Uh, and uh, don't worry about how to end the show. When you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. I love you, Paul. I Thank love you. you. See you in October. I will see you in October. And it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in today. And thank you for listening to our conversation. And I can only say that I wish all of you happiness and joy. Uh, I worked a long time to get to the point where I can comfortably say that to everybody, but believe in yourself, believe in your dreams, and never stop dreaming no matter what your age is. I love you all, and thank you very much. Good night.